time. Our text is the gospel lesson is read. Let's begin in prayer. Now, O oh Lord, open our hearts, our minds to your spirit. Fill us, Lord, that we may stand when the cost gets high, that we may stand in the blood of Christ, in the power of the Spirit, in the forgiveness of the cross, that we may stand, Lord, and in the last day to know that we will be with you, that that is your promise, that is your guarantee, paid for by your blood, given to us in our baptism, renewed to us through your word. In Christ's name, amen. John Maxwell was a former pastor and a leadership trainer, and, and he said something in a seminar that I went to one time that just really caught my attention, and it's something I've thought about for a long time, and that is people quit when the cost gets too high. People quit when the cost gets too high. It doesn't matter whether it's a marriage, a job, a friendship, a challenge, or even their walk with God, people quit when the cost gets too high. People quit when they're asked to go beyond their comfort zone. People quit when they're asked to give up something they love. People quit when they don't think they're being appreciative. People quit when they don't understand the consequences of their choice. People quit when they don't see the end result. In our text today, many of Jesus' disciples quit. They left him. They walked away. And suddenly he's left with just the 12. But before we look at our text today, let's back up 24 hours and look what happened before. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. Jesus went up on a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming towards him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? And he asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fish, as much as they wanted, and when they were full, he told the disciples, collect the leftovers so that as nothing is wasted. So they collected them, and he filled 12 baskets with a piece from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. And when the people saw the sign he had done, they said, truly, this is the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come to take him by force and to make him king, he withdrew again into the mountain by himself. And, of course, this is then where he sends the disciples out, and then later that night he walks across the water. The next day, the crowds that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat. They also saw that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone off alone. Some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got in the boat and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered them, Truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the sign, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for food that perishes, but for food that lasts for eternal life which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. What can we do to perform the work of God, they asked. Jesus replied, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one whom he has sent. What sign, then, are you going to do that we may see and believe you, they asked. 
what are you going to do to perform? Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me, and yet do not believe. <laughs> I want you to notice what happened. People were flocking from all over the area because he was healing people. He was healing all the sick that came to him. And there were came so many of them, and literally there were 5,000 men plus women and children, no place for them to go and get something to eat. And so Jesus now feeds them with two fish and five loaves of bread. After everybody stuff, they collect 12 baskets of leftover. And then they try to make him king, and he takes off because he doesn't want to be made king. And when they find him, he confronts them about the fact they've totally missed what God's doing. All they thought about was they'd gotten a free meal. And then on top of that, I mean, think about the gall of this. They say to him, what sign are you going to do so we may see it and believe in you? He just healed the sick. He just fed 5,000 people. He walked on water, and they want a sign. Give me something else. The truth is, they wanted a bread king. They wanted a king who was automatically going to take care of all their problems. They'd never have a problem again in life. A king who was going to heal their sickness every time automatically. A king who would give them everything they wanted. A king who would meet all their physical needs their wants and their desires, and they miss seeing what Jesus really had to offer. The bad thing is, today we see a lot of disciples just like those. There's a lot of disciples in the church, people who claim to follow Jesus, but people who follow Jesus because they want something. People who follow Jesus because they want to be healed. People who follow Jesus because they want food or luxury or plenty. We see Jesus who followed Jesus so that he can give them what they want. But Jesus did not call us to come and get. He called us to come and follow. Follow him when the path gets rough. Follow him. When the waters around us get violent, follow him when life gets dark and blocks out the sun. Follow him in his sacrifice. Follow him in his suffering. Follow him in his persecution. Follow him. And sooner or later, they say it's too hard. Who can accept this? And they quit. So many are like that. It's just too hard. I quit. They quit following Jesus. They quit trusting in Jesus. They quit seeking Jesus. They quit living for Jesus. The cost got too high. And they quit. So how about you? How about all of you, those of you out listening today online? When does the cost become too high for you? When does the cost come too high in your marriage or in your job or in your family or in your walk with God? When do we get to the point where we say, nope, that's enough. I've sacrificed enough, I've served enough, I've loved enough, I've suffered enough. God, you're asking me to do something I just cannot do. The cost is too high. You know, we live in a world where everything is valued by a cost. You go to the store, you see something you want, you want. What is the first question you ask? How much does it cost? 
Everything is valued by what it costs, whether it be a diamond, whether it be your car, whether it be your house. It's only as valuable as what it costs. Reality is, is that we value everything by what it costs. And the truth is, in our life today, we want everything at the cheapest cost. I just got done ordering the books for the Bible study. I went through every website I could go through, online bookstore, Christian bookstore, to find which one I could get at the absolute cheapest at so that I could save everybody a few pennies. Okay? Okay? When I buy a car, we bought our last car. Found the model we wanted, called around, and I called, kept calling different dealerships until I found the one that was going to sell it to me at the price that I wanted it. I learned I don't go to the dealership until they've already agreed to the price that I want. Now, I'm going to make a confession now to you that is really, really embarrassing. And I did not say this at the early service, but I'm going to tell you. I don't know why, because it's on that stupid video. But I'm telling you anyway. My wife is on her second engagement ring. And the reason for that is because I thought I was getting a really good deal on the first one. And it lasted, what, about three, four weeks before all the fake gold came off and you started turning your fingers different colors? <sighs> Needless to say, the one she's got now came from a reputable dealer. But I had such a good deal on it! Why? Because we want things at the cheapest price, the smallest cost, the least commitment. And as the saying goes, you get what you pay for. So what's the price that you're willing to pay for Christ? What's the price that you are willing to pay for eternal life? That's what they asked Jesus. The people asked him that, and he told them the exact price of a cost. What can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. And Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one whom he has sent. To believe. To believe is the only cost, but sometimes that can be really high. Sometimes it can feel like to believe is a very, very high price. It seems like a high price when sickness invades our lives and we don't know what's going to happen. It seems like a high price when everybody around us is living for themselves and seems to be doing really good. It seems like a high price when we feel alone. Seems like an awful high price when you're struggling with your finances or forgiveness or acceptance or rejection. Sometimes to believe can seem like a very, very high price. Until. Until we listen to the disciples who stayed. So Jesus said to the twelve, you don't want to go away too, do you? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Where are we going to go? You, Lord, have the words of eternal life. Where will we go? What else is there? What other options do we have? Do I live in a bottle? Or with a needle in my arm? Millions are doing that right now. Do I strive to find one person that will make me feel loved and wanted all the time? Do I go from relationship to relationship because I love that high at the first part of that relationship only to watch it fade and then look for it again? Do I run to the American dream and tell myself, if I just have enough, Enough money, enough things, enough nice enough car, a big enough house that everything's going to be okay. Will my bank account ever make up for the hurt that I've gone through? 
struggles that I've had? Well, thinking of only of myself and what's in it for me ever drowned out that emptiness inside of me? Where else is there? You alone have the words of eternal life. You alone, Lord, have the words of comfort when others leave me in hurt. You alone have the words of strength when I feel like I got nothing left. You alone have the words of peace when my life is anything but peaceful. You alone have the words of love when I know that I am anything but lovable. You, Lord, have the words that calm when my life is chaotic, painful, and uncertain. You have the words of eternal life. You know, though, sometimes quitting does seem like a good thing, doesn't it? Sometimes quitting, just giving up, walking away, start over, seems to be a good thing. I can start fresh. I can do it again. I can make up for my mistakes, but the reality is, no matter where we go, we take ourselves. We take ourselves with us. We take our pains. We take our hurts. We take our past. We take our sins with us. From one place to the next, from one relationship to the next, From one hurt to the next, we keep going. It seems easy at times to walk away from a marriage, from life, from family, from a job, even from God. But we always end up in the same place again. Why? Because this world is full of sin, and it is always with us. This world is full of hurt, and it will always find you. This world is full of trouble, and it keeps coming at us. You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. You, Christ, are the Holy One of God. You are the God who became flesh, who humbled yourself to take on the sin you never created or ever wanted. You're the God who took all of the Father's wrath poured out upon you while you hung there helplessly on a cross. You are the God who literally tore himself in two so that you experienced the total emptiness of hell. No hope. No future, no light, only never-ending darkness and pain. You are the Holy One of God who loves us with a love that nothing can compare to, a love that nothing can tear away from us, not life, not death, not pain, nor suffering, not demons, not evil, nothing can take away your love for us. You are the Holy One of God who promised us, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me and my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you. And I am going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that you may be where I am also. That's the words I preached last today to Benita's funeral. Because that's exactly what has happened in her life. God has taken her to be with him. I am preparing a place for you. And I'm going to come. And I am going to take you to myself where you can be where I am also. Think about that. To be where I am also, to be with Christ, to live with him where there is no suffering, no pain, no tears, no anger, no hurt. It really makes me think of a song by Chris Tomlin called Home. This world is not what it was meant to be. All this pain, all this suffering, 
There's a better place waiting for me in heaven. Every tear will be wiped away. Every sorrow and sin erased will dance on seas of amazing grace. In heaven, in heaven, I'm going home where the streets are golden. Every chain is broken. Oh, I want to go. Oh, I want to go home where every fear is gone. I'm in your open arms where I belong. What cost would be so high that you would give up the gift that you were given? What cost could be so high that you would walk away from a love that is unending, a peace that is unshakable, and a future that is with God? You know why the cost gets too high? The cost gets too high because our sights are too low. Because we're looking down here instead of up there. Today, God calls you to look up at the cross. Look into the eyes of the Holy One of God and see the love He has for you. Look up and realize there was no cost too high for you. There was no expense too high for God to pay so that you and I could be with him forever. So you and I could go home. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus from this day forward to life everlasting. Amen.